Hello all. Uh, my name is Gil Mazuz. I'm VP of Engineering at Upstream, where I lead the software development, um, data engineering, data science, and DevOps. Before Upstream, I was nine years at NSO, where I founded the uh, real-time data analytics and intelligence domain. So today we're going to talk about cybersecurity and data management for connected vehicles. We're going to start with the challenges with connected that brings us connected vehicle data, and there are many. We're going to see how upstream data management and cybersecurity platform solve those these challenges and aim to solve them. We're going to show how we utilized cloud agnostic architecture with OpenShift in order to deploy our platform easily. And of course, questions at the end, if there are any. So let's begin. So today, today, um, almost every new vehicle is connected, whether it's connected by telematics controller unit or any other form. So the automotive industry is accelerating toward a technology centric future with connectivity at its heart. Data and connectivity are the foundation of connected vehicles and the automotive industry's transformation. comes in many ways. There are so many data sources, whether it's a, a key fob, whether it's a, a mobile application that controls uh, the V. Car to the vehicle, uh, to the server, telemet telemetry and so forth. There are so many data sources. The need for improved driving and better customer experience pushes OEMs to create new technologically advanced innovations that are enabled by this connectivity. Unfortunately, the other side of connectivity is that it widens the attack surface for hackers to find new attack vectors and exploit every flaw, leaving vehicles, networks, and backend servers vulnerable. So we can see here, there are so many vectors and, and exploits that could be in, in, in this domain. You have the backend server. So imagine yourself, someone, a hacker attacks uh, the telematic server of a specific OEM. He can control the entire fleet. He might send commands that control the entire fleet, say close the doors and no one can enter or even something worth. You have mobile applications. A hacker can also uh, uh, hack to a specific vehicle or to uh, an application server that receives uh, mobile application uh, commands that are moving from this application attack vectors with all of this data. So this technology comes with a dis with with a risk. That's where upstream comes to to the rescue. So upstream. One of our passwords is unlocking the value of mobility data. And that's what we do. Upstream aims to unlock the value in connected vehicles data to help stakeholders secure their assets. First of all, security, to make sure that the assets are not compromised, comply with regulations, improve vehicle data quality, and identify new business opportunities. Upstream introduced a fundamental innovative shift in the approach to connected vehicle security predictive maintenance, automotive insurance, and business intelligence. It is fueled, empowered, and unlocked by a cloud-based data management platform, purpose-built for connected vehicles. Upstream Security provides a cloud-based data management platform, purpose-built for connected vehicles, delivering unparalleled autom automotive cybersecurity detection and response vehicle detection and response, and data-driven applications. The upstream platform unlocks the value of vehicle data, empowering customers to build connected vehicle applications by transforming highly distributed vehicle data into centralized, structured, contextualized data lakes. And I'm going to show that uh, in, in a few slides in, in more thoroughly. And of course, upstream customers include some of the world's leading automotive OEMs, suppliers, and others protecting millions of vehicles. 
So let's talk about Red Hat OpenShift and the upstream cloud agnostic architecture. So first of all, let's see how the platform is built, how the, how the flow, how the data flow goes through the platform. So data comes from many sources, as we've mentioned before. Data comes from telematic servers, from the vehicles themselves, from applications. All of this data requires a serious data engineering and data ingestion flow in order to make it to make good use of it, in order to protect it, in order to have services upon it and other applications. So the first phase is this data is going through is data normalization and cleansing. So we are cleaning the data, making sure that unsorted data, even in real time, can be sorted to a sort to, to a specific amount of to, to a specific extent. Um, and make sure that the data is unified in order for us to make sense of it. After that, we deduce a digital twin from this data. Now, digital twin, imagine yourself if the actual vehicle state is like, a, it's a virtual uh, uh, representation of the vehicle. Now, that has its own challenges because, you know, for instance, if uh, the velocity of, of a vehicle was uh, 80 miles per hour, uh, before five minutes, is it still 80 miles per hour? If that's the last signal we receive. So you need to ma manage and maintain all of the state and to make sure that it's still relevant and still up to date. And after that, uh, based upon all, the, all those signals and the digital twin, we have an AI, artificial intelligence power detection, where we detect anomalies in cyber attacks and other forms of models that utilize the data. <clears throat> Up top of this platform, we were building applications. So we have cybersecurity application that first and foremost uh, guards and, 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 and protects the vehicles and the servers. We also have uh, advanced analytics and other uses and other, other uh, uh, applications for the data, such as insurance, predictive maintenance, business intelligence, data quality validation. There are so many corrupted data that are getting, that the, the OEMs are getting and, 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 and our customers are getting. And also the ability to create third-party applications upon this data. So let's drill down a little bit more into the architecture. Now, one of the first biggest challenges that we had is that we are the being deployed in the customer's virtual private cloud usually or virtual private cloud or on-prem we cannot have we cannot say okay we we rely on the cloud because we sometimes can be deployed on aws we can deploy it on gcp we can deploy on azure and we even can be deployed on-prem so how do you handle this kind of a challenge so let's go over a little bit of our, uh, into our components and see how OpenShift helped us uh, uh, in this challenge. So we have, you know, we use Kafka, obviously Kafka and not something like, uh, you know, uh, dedicated uh, um, stream platforms, but Kafka because we can deploy it everywhere. So we use Kafka uh, for the ingestion and, and message brokering. So we have messages that coming for all messages that coming from all of our sources. It goes through a macro server, a macro service that doing the parsing and normalization and all of that. Uh, by the way, macro service is a term that Uber uh, uh, mentioned because you know when you have too many microservices, it's hard to maintain. So sometimes it's good to unify them and have a clear interface with a clear domain over each macro service. That's what we did. Um, after this uh, normalization and ingestion, there are clean signals and unified signals that are going to a new topic. And of course, after that, there's the processing, detection, enforcement, and so forth. Uh, we are using Redis for state store, Postgres SQL for, uh, for uh, entity, uh, business entity storage. Makes sense because hierarchical entities are built like that, and it's much easier to, to, to uh, query them with SQL. Uh, we use, of course, logs uploader, machine learning models uh, uh, in our data lake. And we use Presto, or to be, to be more accurate, Trino, uh, in order to query this data and also for our machine learning uh, and machine learning operations. So that's, that's a drill down 
for uh, into our architecture. This architecture we use we utilized with OpenShift in order to to have it as much as cloud agnostic as we can. So Upstream was designed to run over cloud infrastructure agnostically, as I've mentioned, AWS, Azure, GCP, using Helm to deploy and install Upstream platform and supporting third-party app components. Upstream utilized cloud services such as PostgreSQL DB, Redis, Object Storage, and here we found the OpenShift operators equivalents out of the box. What happened is that it actually replaced for us the managed services that we used to have from the cloud. So if we wanted a managed service, instead of that, we could have used an OpenShift operator and to know that it doesn't matter where we deploy it, we know that it will act the same and it will remain the same. And that's super easy to maintain when you have this trait. The OpenShift advantages that we've seen are many. So the first advantage that we had is ease of use. Deployment of operators shortened upstream time to deliver end-to-end -end full blown solution because now you have a marketplace. You can you know deploy operator and 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 that that gives you a functionality that a managed service used to do without rely on a specific cloud provider. We have an operator marketplace which is a very large place where you can find most, if not all, of official releases for cloud native services and applications. And it's one-click deployment. It's one-click deployment and you have this operator service, which is, again, super convenient. Deployment, we use Helm. OpenShift is based upon Kubernetes, obviously, so Helm works here out of the box. Support deployment for best practices of cloud native Kubernetes applications. Maintenance. We have also built-in metrics in an OpenShift console that provided us better visibility and overall view of the running workloads. It was really easy for us to see what's happening in our cluster because of the OpenShift console. Security. I think this, this is one of the biggest ones. So we all know how, how, how big advantage OpenShift gives to security. So the fact that we were, we were able to run in separate projects, easy to segregate, and the segregation, which is easy to segregate between two projects, easy to assign user roles and control access, was great for us and was great for the customer that were hosting us because they could sleep well at night because they knew that we don't have a domain permissions, we have a segregated project, and we knew that we can't hurt their cluster in any ways, and it gave, gave us, you know, peace of mind. Also, wildcard, you know, the ability to work and get the SSL for free without managing the certificate, you know, to work with the asterisk.cluster.openshift with on all the routes within the cluster. Again, very simple, very straightforward. And multi-tenancy, which you can be, it can be deployed in a multi-vendor cluster with no cluster level admin permissions, which we can run multi-projects on the same cluster uh, um, with different permissions of user, which I mentioned before, we have a specific customer that that was a must uh, uh, requirement for him and OpenShift allowed us to do so. And again, to allow them to sleep well and for us as well with the full segregation and not hurting other vendors that are deployed there. Furthermore, eventually, uh, I can tell you without, of course, mentioning the customer that we had a very big OEM, very big customer that we have moved our platform due to its specific needs uh, more than once. We moved it from Azure to on-prem to GCP. And all of this and, and was really straightforward due to the fact we had OpenShift. We had platform as a service built in for us for deployment and with our cloud agnostic architecture, all of it fit, uh, fit really well because our architecture, I think almost almost, almost all of it, without maybe the, the outliers, is fully agnostic. It's fully cloud agnostic and, and we needed re good replacements and OpenShift provided this to us. So to deploy and, with ha and to have a single code base when you have an entire R&D department that, and that that maintain single code base and still be able to deploy yourself in so many different forms uh that's a great trait 
and OpenShift helped us utilize that very well. So that's um, that's basically OpenShift and cybersecurity and data management platform that we did. Uh, there is, of course, some time for questions and answers from the audience. Thank you, Gil. Great presentation. I'm just looking at any questions. Uh, meanwhile, I had a question for you regarding what are the kind of challenges you found while running upstream platform using OpenShift? So this actually was a challenge that eventually became an advantage. It's a great question. So um, the fact that in one of our customers, we, we, we were running as a guest, we didn't have any root permissions, had some of our components, such as machine learning operations, for instance, uh, uh, being, being a little bit more complicated because we didn't have all the permissions we need. But what it allowed us is to do the configurations and changing in order for all of the, the, the platform, including this ML ops, to run without root permissions. So we actually evolutionized the platform to be able to run as guests completely. And that takes us to the next level because that actually helped us being even more agnostic, not just agnostic with the cloud, but even even very lightweight with the permissions required to run the platform, which is very convenient and it's very important when you deploy yourself in different customers that, again, security is very important for them. So that was uh, a challenge that we eventually made an advantage. Mm -hmm. And also, I think uh, you touched upon an important point. You, were, you had to change the cloud multiple times sometimes so from GCP to Azure and all the, so how important is a cloud agnosticism? Was that a one-off case or that is that how you have architected your system in terms of being cloud agnostic? So to be honest, at the beginning, obviously, I mean, I think everyone that comes to, to, to develop data platform, data engineering platform, some kind of way, uh, especially in our days, wants to, to rely on, on a specific cloud at, at first, because, you know, you get a lot of things for free. You get a lot of managed services. You get a lot of good stuff for free, and you can rely upon that. But very, very soon we saw that this is not feasible due to the nature of our customers, due to the uh, sensitivity of the data, due to the fact that we need to be extremely flexible. So... For, I would say almost from the beginning, when we when we uh, started designing the platform, uh, uh, we thought about we need to be cloud agnostic to some extent. We we didn't believe how it, how bigger was the extent that we eventually did because uh, eventually almost each component we said, okay, listen, we have to find a replacement for this managed service, and 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 eventually we've made it. We, we we've made it. That's what exactly what we did. And OpenShift, as I mentioned, helped us with that because wherever outlier we had, which was, okay, listen, we need we need that, we could have replaced with an operator in order to have this peace of mind. So eventually, component after component, a piece after piece, we almost did the entire platform uh, to be cloud agnostic. And that was super important. It was, it was crucial for our business. Uh, it has many advantages. It's the uh, flexibility of, of the platform is, 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 is amazing. And that's, that's one of our um, um, biggest advantages. So yeah, uh, it's, it was very important. And, and, uh, and I think, and I think we, we knew that we need to have that. Again, the other option was to maintain multiple R&D departments and code bases. And I, I don't think it's fun for anyone to do that. I didn't want to do this. So I think we, we've chosen the right, the right alternative. Yeah, great. I mean to say the cloud technologies are evolving so fast on a day-to-day -day basis and also maintaining your platform to be agile. I think that's one of the USPs of any platform providers. Thanks a lot, Gil. Um, Thank you very much. That's it from my side. Just checking uh, if there are any other questions. So there is one question that came from JC. Can you give us an example of what kind of vulnerability can be reduced or detected by data normalization and cleansing in this architecture? Oh, of course, there are. Unfortunately, there are many, mm -hmm. but 
But let's just say, for instance, uh, injection. Okay, you, you can have an, a SQL injection in in into the car. You can have an, even even that, or or SQL injection to the telematic server, for instance, or or some kind of attack chain. All of those things, in order for you to analyze and to have to understand an anomaly, or for instance, uh, let's just say brute force attack. Okay. In order for, for, for a, a detection platform to understand if it was an attack or just, you know, just big amount of, 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 of messages that came right now, you need to analyze the pattern. The machine needs to analyze the pattern to understand the anomaly. In order to do so, all the data that you have from all the vehicles and specifically from a specific vehicle and from the servers and from the applications, needs to talk in the same language, needs to be unified. If it's not unified, you can you cannot start doing machine learning models upon that. You can't, it's very hard to uh, identify patterns upon it. But once you clean the data, you unify it, you put it in a unified schema, you can work upon that and you can start doing advanced things. One of them is anomaly detection and attack chain detection, for instance. Hope that answered your question. Thanks a lot, Gil. Great presentation. Thanks for clarifying the questions. Thank and you very much. Uh, have a nice day.